Thank you for participating in this webinar about IPR. During the webinar, I will be switching a little bit between different settings, so please bear over me if something doesn't just go completely fluently. But let's dive in. So, the topic of today, IPR, guesswork not required. Can we perform IPR more predictable, more efficient, and with less guesswork? As I do not know the level of experience of the doctors participating in this webinar, I will start going through some basics before we look at some efficient and predictable ways to perform IPR and how to avoid some of the typical problems related to IPR. The webinar is made in collaboration with Dentados, who, in my opinion at least, makes the best IPR tools on the market, and I will show you these in a moment. The topic will cover solutions that uh, can be utilized with any clear line of system on the market. My name is Jesper Hatt. My wife and I started treating patients with clear liners in our dental practice back in 2008. In 2018, I stopped practicing in order to help practice owners achieve more personal satisfaction and financial freedom. In 2020, my wife and I founded a liner service where we help dentists master clear uh, aligner treatments in 14 different countries. We consider ourselves silent partners of the practices we work with. We take care of case evaluation, treatment planning, setup optimization and mentoring of general dentists, orthodontists and their teams. Some of the advantages of clear aligners are the treatment can ensure the right amount of force on every single tooth in a dental arch. This creates minimal pain and maximum predictability. Starting a journey with clear aligners can be the same, but it can also be a very painful experience. Aligner service gives the dentists the opportunity to implement clear aligner therapy in their practices in steps that fit the individual doctor the best, avoiding painful experiences. We have identified these three elements as crucial for successful implementation of clear aligners in any dental practice. Clinical confidence is by far the most important part in achieving success. There are so many factors going into clinical confidence, and IPR being just one of them, that it is impossible to gain enough knowledge and experience in a one or two day course to gain clinical confidence. That is why I'd like to introduce you to our line of service concept. We talk about mastering clear liners versus a clear liner master. So the first step towards clinical confidence is mastering clear liners. And in order to start mastering clear liners, the entire team needs to be comfortable about the clear liner workflow. Pick any clear liner system you, you, you like to and stick to it until everybody in the, in, the, in the practice is comfortable using it. Implement safe, predictable, and profitable routines in your clear liner workflow. Our liner service has developed a pick and choose based program that enables any dental practice to start safe and create a foundation for success with clear liner treatments. We'll let you and your team outsource all of these elements to a liner service. And as the first company in the world, uh, we support the team online through the entire liner treatment. Dr. Hellerhat hosts monthly online study clubs with differing themes. This enables the doctors slowly become more and more clinically confident. And we train doctors and teams how to get to yes, presenting comprehensive treatments. Just as we offer advanced orthodontic training. Now, we have all of these elements that we need to take into account when we create our clear line workflow. During our program or the ones you pick, the doctor decides which procedures will be done by the doctor or which will be outsourced, either to team members or to an external partner like Aligner Service. At Aligner Service, Dr. Hellerhead is responsible for treatment planning quality control. And I will say she's been training more than 1,500 dentists and clinical supporters, as well as helped to improve more than 7,000 complex clear aligner treatment plans, both for orthodontists and general dentists. And today we support general dentists and orthodontists in 14 different countries, as well as we perform internal training and education in our own team of dentists, where Dr. Hellehat is the one ensuring the in-house quality among all our dentists. 
With this all said, let's take a look at today's topic. In regards to outsourcing or not, should IPR, IPR be outsourced to a hygienist or dental assistant? Well, not in our opinion. And I will get into this in, in a moment, uh, why we don't think outsourcing IPR is the best uh, idea. When we work with clear liners, we want maximum predictability. A less predictable clear line treatment requires more chair time. More chair time will cost a lot more money. It creates a less positive experience for the patient and thereby decreases the chances of referrals. When we start a clear line of treatment without having a system that ensures maximum predictability, the consequences can catch up with us in some unfortunate ways as we just press on and press on. Usually the problems tend to become bigger and bigger and bigger. And that is what we'd like to avoid. So these are the five steps required for maximum predictability. Today I'll be going through some of these, but not all of them. Solid diagnostics are a prerequisite for performing orthodontic treatments at all. Not only do we need to be able to diagnose the malocclusions, with clear line of treatments we also need to identify the possible challenges that can occur during a treatment and identify the causes when a treatment doesn't track according to our treatment plan. The two solutions to this challenge, do it yourself or outsource. I'll go through a couple of issues that I think are important to consider before starting any clear line treatment. Uh, limiting oneself to straightening the eight anterior teeth rarely results in the ideal treatment of the patient. More often than not, these kind of limitations require more aggressive use of IPR extractions. Consider whose interests are served by the narrative of safer and more predictable treatments this way. The patient, the dentist or the aligner manufacturer. In my opinion, these two cases should be considered comprehensive cases. Now, limiting treatment to one jaw is rarely a good idea. At aligner service, we often find that the desire for treating only one jaw more often than not originates from the patient's desires. The limitations of treating only one jaw often results in significant compromises. Moreover, after treatment, patients who have had only one jaw corrected often see everything that was not corrected and wonder why the dentist did not insist on correcting this as well. It's like, would you let your treatment of a single crown be dictated by a patient? Would you... Would you consider letting a patient dictate the, where the prep should be? What kind of material? What color? What I mean, everything, the occlusion, what type of occlusion? Same goes for implants. I mean, it's, it's funny to me why we let patients dictate whether we treat one or two jaws in regards to orthodontics. We are the ones responsible for the treatment, so we should take the decision. Extraction should raise an alarm, at least in my opinion. It may look tempting as it can look so much easier than doing a lot of IPR, especially when we see it on a computer screen. But consider this. Many orthodontists are afraid of extractions, basically because it's extremely difficult to control the movements of the neighboring teeth uh, in a predictable manner. In my opinion, if orthodontists worry about extractions, well, so do I. That is why extractions, um, I mean, they usually they raise a red flag for me when I see them in a, in a clean check or in a setup. And I'd like you to think about this. Do you really believe this would happen in reality? I mean, it happens on the screen. Everything looks so easy on the screen. But please... Don't be fooled. Algorithms are not very good at giving us a biologically sound outcome or predictable treatment plan. The same goes for the technicians who design our digital treatment sequences or clean checks. Everything is possible on a screen. But it is cartoon dentistry. It looks so cool. It feels nice initially and it looks so simple. But when we have a patient in the chair with tracking issues and lots of unforeseen challenges, it's suddenly not that cool anymore. 
Remember, designers are not orthodontists. And no orthodontist goes through the ClinCheck before it is sent to the dental office. The treating doctor is 100% responsible for the treatment. Schedules and systems might help us, but experience is essential to determine if the treatment is biologically safe, predictable, and can be performed as proposed by the artificial intelligence or the computer technician designing the initial ClinCheck for the aligner company. Each step of the treatment plan needs to be reviewed for each tooth. Typically, an experienced clear line dentist spends between 30 and 60 minutes per treatment plan before, before it has an ideal treatment design. Experience pays off in terms of avoiding multiple controls uh, and control appointments, as well as additional aligners. In cases with more than 25 aligners, um, one should always expect and need for additional aligners. It's not always the case, but expect it. Let the patient know there is a risk that we need additional aligners. Just look at the case here on the screen. I mean, it's obvious that there's a huge risk for additional aligners, which is okay because we are treating biology and we can't, we can't always um, predict what the biologically is or how the biology is going to have to um, to react to our treatment think about these three three elements when you create your clear line of treatment plan now if we look at the sequence will it happen what kind of movements do we want to achieve in what order would you like the movements to take place what number and type of attachments or engages what is the function of those when do we need them and, and why? Those are things that I would always think about uh, when I look at a, a sequence or a, um, a, a treatment setup. Does the proposed type of or number make sense or does something need to be changed? I'll not go into the crucial elements of anchorage and force distribution today as the focus of this webinar is on IPR. But we need to look at the amount of IPR where and how much do we need to do IPI in both the upper and the lower jaw? I mean, rarely uh, there is an indication for this, but it happens depending on the biology and the facial profile of the patient. But we as doctors need to take a critical look at the computer setup coming from us, uh, from the, uh, from the aligner company and it's presented to us. Where should we perform the IPR in the anterior or the posterior segment? Are there restorations that can re be reshaped or, uh, or modified in any way in order to save enamel? I think those are thoughts that we should go through before we accept any treatment plan from, from an, an aligner company. Now, in regards to reshaping the approximal area of the teeth, um, there was a study made in Brazil some years ago uh, where they studied the thickness of the enamel in the approximal area. And the thinnest enamel was found in the lower incisors. And here the, um, the, the, um, the thickness was about 0.6 millimeters. Premolars in the mandible had a one millimeter thickness of the, uh, of the enamel. And, um, Taking this into consideration, I mean, one gets the thought that if we take away too much enamel, we will have a problem of sensitivity and, and increased risk of, of carriers. The, the scientists did not see an increase in carriers as long as there was residual enamel. But they also stated that we need long-term follow-up. But I think it's important here to look at the numbers and, and ask ourselves, okay, if we do 0.5 millimeter or 0.6 millimeters of IPR, we need to be sure that the amount of IPR is done on um, equally on, on both teeth, which would equal 0.25 or 0.3 millimeters on each tooth, and thereby only reducing 50% of the enamel on each tooth. Now, can we do that with a burr? 
Yeah, well, it is possible, but it's really, really difficult. And we don't have a calibrated way to do this. And I'll get back to that in a moment. So I'd always be aware. Ask yourself, is this the right treatment? I would be critical. Will we achieve what we want with this exact clean check or setup? And be meticulous when you perform your IPR. Now, this is a case um, where we were asked for help um, in, in regards to a doctor experiencing a posterior open bite that had developed in, in a patient during treatment. The case had several issues related to the treatment plan and the setup. And I will not go into any details about the anterior inclination, the anchorage, or the requirements to upright molars and all of this stuff. But what I will address is the fact that this doctor believed he had performed the needed amount of IPR according to his own initial treatment plan. However, comparing the initial intraoral scan with the second scan, we were able to conclude that far less IPR than planned had been performed. And this is something we see fairly often in cases where posterior open bites develop during treatment. Now, if we don't reduce the enamel enough the first time we perform our IPR, we have no idea how much enamel is left. We will not be able to measure how much IPR was actually performed, and, ten, and hence will not be able to, to know how much enamel is left for us to be on a biologically safe side in regards to interproximal reduction. When we plan additional aligners after too little IPR has been performed, the aligner software might react as if the planned amount of IPR was performed and give us a warning just as you can see in this uh, clean check from Indesign. This creates a challenge in regards to the precision of IPR. And this is one of the major reasons why we should work very, very meticulously when we perform our planned IPR. So the interesting part is, as I mentioned in the beginning, can we perform IPR more predictable, more efficient, with less guesswork? And here are my recommendations in regards to IPR. Loosen up the tight contact points. In this regard, I would create a little bit of space with a strip. Secondly, use the Dentatus Profine IPR. This is how they look. And this is the only IPR on the market that is calibrated. And I'll try to show you how it looks. Um, I might get a little bit away from the microphone in order to show you it. But here you can see the, uh, the tips. You can see the, um, the way they are marked here in the button. Um, and point 0.1 is because it's 0.1 millimeter, 0.2, 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5 millimeters, which means these tips are all calibrated to the amount of IPR that we are planning in our clean checks or setups. Now, first of all, I think that is really cool because as you get used to using these tips, suddenly you don't need to use a, um, a measurement device approximately between the teeth. As you can see, the there are two the, the thinnest versions of these look a little bit different. You can see the uh, the diamond um, the diamonds covering this tip uh, differs a little bit from the others, and that's because this um, 0 0.1 millimeter tip has a um, um, 15 micron diamond um, coating, which enables it uh, to be used. Um, for, um, for polishing the teeth. So even after you have done your uh, IPR, you can polish the approximal surfaces with these tips. Now, um, right now you might think, well, how does this work? Because I mean, they, they can't rotate. Uh, and I will get back to that in a moment. Just, just um, bear over with me. So let's take a look at um, the third recommendation here. Um, here so the um, the tips um, go into this special handpiece the dentatus handpiece uh, i've had a handpiece like this for 25 years um in my own practice well i had several of them but one of them was 25 years old 
and it it was uh, it just worked as if it had been bought within a week. So I know Dentados is is probably not that happy about the longevity of their products as they won't sell that many. But um, as a practice owner, I thought that was really really great. So um, well, this is the uh, the handpiece. Uh, as I said in my private office, I will not be able to put it into um, the dental chair. Now there are some um, some things that are worth to point out. The um, the tips here. They go into the handpiece. Uh, you just push them in, and I'll see how easy this slips in like this. Now there is a little detail here. It actually rotates freely in the handpiece. Now this is a um, a really new handpiece, so it's there's a little bit of friction here. But the fact that this um, tip here can rotate freely makes it really, really easy to um, slide it in between the teeth and let the, the morphology of the teeth dictate the, the way of insertion, which makes it quite uh, safe to use. And I really like that. Now, once we have created the, um, the IPR we want to, we are able to, you can see here that these small indentations here, we are actually able to, um, let's see if I can illustrate this. We're able to click it into one of these and now it can't rotate. So the tips aren't able to rotate anywhere. I can just um, keep the, the position as I'd like to. This enables the doctor to, um, to, um, how do you say it? Um, to shape this, the approximal surface as you want to. Now I know there are products on the market where you just have a knob up here that you can where you can change these settings. And I was uh, attending a dental fair some time ago with an engineer who just shook his, his head about this. He said, "Well, you know, a system like this will hold up forever, but with a knob, it's a question of time before that knob." is no more um isn't accurate anymore so we will have some kind of sloppiness in the way uh, things are fixated in the handpiece i hope this makes sense now it is obvious if you've already performed a lot of ipr that you can't just start with a 0.5 millimeter um uh, tip i don't know if you're able to see it but they are quite thick uh, when you want to uh, get through an proximal area. So I would usually start with one of the uh, first ones. Personally, I would usually start with the 0.2 millimeter tip and then go upwards to until I had the, um, the amount of um, approximal reduction that I wanted to achieve. To begin with, I always used a measuring device to make sure that I had the right um, uh, space that I needed. But over time, I got to um, to trust the uh, the IPR system more and more. But it, I mean, it's it's a matter of experience. So you need to experience this first. So again, you can see there are uh, these different tips, and you can also see there's a different design on the most um, on, the, on the thinnest parts here as on the others. And that's because when you have something like this that has a thickness. Of what of 0 0.1 millimeter. I mean, it this is so thin that they needed to design this tip in a way where it wouldn't break. So if they had a design like this, these tips would definitely break. But since they have um, make made them like these, the tips won't break. It they are actually quite sturdy. Usually if I had a design like this and I just pull, pushed it, a piece of metal like this would usually break, but they don't. Now, another great thing is, as I mentioned before, and I, I really like to point this out again. It's really, really critical for me to know that if I want a 0.3 millimeter approximal space, I get exactly 0.3 millimeter when I use one of this, oh, oh, sorry, the yellow tip here. So 0.3 millimeters ensures that I get exactly 
three millimeters. Now, just remember this. I, I will get back to this in a moment. But let's take a look at some of the other things I think are rather important in regards to the IPR. I'd like you to think about the morphology. So, okay, one thing. Remember to polish the uh, proximal uh, surfaces as soon as you have done the IPR. As I mentioned, you can use the uh, sorry, you can use the uh, 0.1 millimeter uh, tip in order to polish the surface. You can see it's a different type of diamond gridding that is here. It's a it's a 15 micron diamond coating, which enables us to use this part to um, polish. Of course, you can use a rotating disc or something else, but this is far better in my opinion, because these, I'll just take one of these out again. As I mentioned before, when you use these tips in the handpiece, the handpiece will move the tip back and forth. It won't rotate them. It will only move back and forth. Okay. And it has a really delicate way to do this. The design of this and the amount of space that it moves back and forth ensures that it won't um, make the gingival tissue bleed if you touch them. You won't get any bleeding from the gingival uh, tissue or from the lips or the tongue should they get into contact with this. Now compare this to a rotating instrument. If you use a rotating instrument and, and you hit the gingival tissue or the lip or the tongue, you will, I mean, it's, it's just a, a mess with all the blood that just flows all over the place and you won't be able to see anything quite clearly anymore. So first of all, I think that's a challenge. Yes, I tried it myself several times before I found these tips. Um, and um, secondly, the size of these are perfect for the, uh, for the IPR. I, I know it looks a little bit big, but and Dentatus has also um, a polishing kit for the same system, which has been around for, I mean, 20 years, maybe more. And in my practice, we started using those tips until these came to the market. Um, the smaller tips are great for polishing. They have some, um, some polishing devices that are great that are smaller if you want to uh, reshape the teeth, the surface of the teeth. But to be honest, I think you can just go with these. Um, and they are much easier and, and much faster to work with when you do your IPR. So again, they move, move back and forth instead of uh, doing any kind of rotation. Um, all right. So think about the morphology. Um, I, I, I took this picture from um, some of the slides that are delivered to participants of the digital smile design course that were held years ago by Christian Coachman. And here, it, I think these uh, illustrations um, really show the shape of the teeth um, according to the um, to the profile of the patient, and how the shape of the teeth and the inclination of the teeth can change the personality of the patient. I think we should really take into consideration what the teeth look like initially before we start to reshape them approximately, even though it's only 0.5 millimeters that we remove maybe 0.6 at the most um i mean in even though we do that little it, it really can show through a lot if we do it in a wrong way so i think it's it's really great to take these uh, the shapes into consideration and now I, I do know i show the upper anteriors at the moment and on the next picture as well um, because it's obviously here we'll see the biggest uh, changes. But think about how the shape and inclination of the teeth influences the visual perception of the personality of the patient. And as I mentioned, Christian Coachman describes this in his courses about digital smile design. Um, and these are the models shown. Um, these models that I show here are, are from the uh, DSD templates. Um, so if you're interested in this, I, I highly recommend his course. I have no financial interest in, in recommend, 
Dr. Coachman's uh, courses, but I really, really like the quality of his work and, and the courses he hosts. So uh, if you have any interest in this, here's my thumbs up for Christian Coachman. <laughs> All right. Um, planning of IPR and clean checks and setups is essential. Now, I would like to note that you should at all costs avoid round tripping. I will get back to this in a moment and show you an example of this. But if at all possible, avoid round tripping. This might require a few extra visits, but will reduce the risk of facial bone loss and, um, and gingival recessions during or the years following treatment. Um, so remember the mobility of the teeth when you do your IPR. Um, too little IPR will result in an anterior open bite, typically. And this can lead to panic or need for additional aligners. Um, so let's take it at the different steps here. The first step is typically no mobility is uh, that much of a problem. But uh, think about it. When you treat the patient with clear aligners, the teeth start to become quite mobile. And it's very, very natural. It's just a part of the teeth moving in the bone. Okay. So the first place we go down and do some IPR, there's usually not a, pro a problem um, achieving the amount of space that we need between the teeth. Now, the second step, here mobility starts to become a challenge. And I will try to illustrate it here. So you can see, usually we push the neighboring teeth apart um, with our IPR tip. I hope this makes sense. Um, as the teeth move during IPR, we tend to believe we have performed enough IPR because we are able to press down our instrument between the teeth or even the measuring device that we use. Now, when we move our IPR device, the teeth move back into position. And since we're working in the range of 0.1 to 0.3 millimeters, it is impossible for us to see this clinically. We have to measure. Now, when we measure, we need to be aware that our measuring device will do the same as our IPR tips. So we can just push it down and push the teeth aside. As we perform IPR on several teeth, it becomes more and more easy to displace the neighboring teeth and thereby creating something like this, where the initial IPR was done perfectly, but the next and the next again, these areas are not as um, as wide as they should be according to our initial plan. Creating the right amount of IPR is a matter of experience. Measuring devices need to slide effortlessly through the approximal area. With experience, the dentatus tips, as I mentioned, can be used as measuring device while you do your IPR. And this will reduce the time spent on IPR as well. So, what should we look for? What should the patient be aware of? And what kind of communication should we have with the patient? Um, at delivery, um, we look at tracking issue issues. On the left picture, you can see some, I think it was, uh, it's probably a click correct aligners that were put in. You can see the straight trim line, the material was a little bit thicker. Um, and here there was air between the uh, incisal edge of the aligner and the teeth. But this was up on insertion. Now, the difference between the aligner and, and the teeth is just an expression of, um, of a programmed or pre-programmed movement that has been planned, which has not been able to show through in, um, in the aligner yet. On the right-hand side, you see a patient who has been wearing his aligners for two weeks. And this is a control visit after uh, probably uh, six or eight weeks where something has become, uh, well, has gotten out of hand. So the, there's a definite tracking issue. If we go back to the picture on the, on the left again, I'll put another picture in. Here you see a typical issue, which is not as bad as the one on the right. But here you see a... Um, a, uh, an incisor in the lower jaw, which is being pushed uh, facially um, or, or buccally. Um, 
because the the amount of IPR done in the lower jaw was not enough, and this was the the one tooth that was easily pushed anteriorly instead of being kept inside. So here it was only a matter of going back one aligner, do a little extra IPR, and the, and the tooth started to track again. Now, obviously, if you look at the upper jaw, there was a need for additional aligners as well in order to get the right inclination of the central incisors, but that's another thing. Now, there are some challenges about timing of IPR. Timing of IPR is critical and needs to be planned before we start treatment. Some aligner systems force us to do all the IPR at the first stage of treatment, or they decrease um, our flexibility in order to plan when we want to do the IPR. Uh, this is from a system with limited flexibility in regards to planning the IPR. Um, some setups or clean checks dictate an unfavorable timing, as I mentioned, and this is a system as well that does that. Um, and this can be a huge challenge as it is virtually impossible to measure if we have done the exact amount of IPR we need to do if the teeth aren't in a position where we actually can do it. So let me try to illustrate this with some clinical images. Now, um, I'd like to apologize for the scratches you see in the, in the mirror. So please bear over with me here. But it's, it's, I think it's a great example of... Um, of the challenges we face if we have to do all the IPR at once. So when is it possible to achieve predictability? If we look at the green markings, I believe it would be possible to achieve some sort of predictability in these areas. And I hope you agree. As you can see, the teeth are positioned in a way where our IPR tip will slide through um, and enable us to remove the exact measurable amount of enamel on both the one and the other teeth. Okay, so if we take a look at this picture, here it's virtually impossible with the yellow markings. Here we need something to change before we can do any IPR. And in order to prevent round tripping, sometimes we need to sequence the IPR in different stages of the treatment. If we plan it smart, oftentimes we'll be able to do this intelligently in order to minimize the amount of chair time. So we don't necessarily need to see the patient at a liner number 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, but we can plan it in ways where we, let's say, um, do the IPI in all the green markings, and after a while, the anterior teeth will have moved into a position where it's um, more predictable the way we can do our IPR. I hope this makes sense. Um, and let's just take a look without all the markings so you can see the difference, okay? So I hope you see the difference here. The yellow markings are the places where it's virtually impossible to get a predictable result. Now, round tripping. It's fast, it's easy, but has some unwanted long-term side effects. In this case, the inclination of the teeth was also less than ideal. So therefore, move the roots into the desired position first, then move the clinical crowns. Um, I'd like to point out as well that there, there are differences between um, the, the way the Americans um, position their anteriors uh, and and the way the Europeans tend to, to place their interiors. So in, um, I'll try to see if I can illustrate this. In the United States, we often see that the, um, the aligner setups are set with quite steep anteriors um, like this. In Europe, we would rather have the anteriors to be placed like this. So there is a quite of a difference here. And most aligner companies uh, utilize the American way um, to position their anteriors. Um, so if you're a European-based uh, dentist, please be aware that you always, almost always have to change the uh, angulation of the roots. So um, in Europe, we often call this um, uh, root talk, but the technicians will use the term root tip. So <laughs> there are some challenges here, but uh, please, 
shoot me an email if you have any questions in regard to this, and I'll try to explain it in a, in a more uh, in-depth um, way. Okay, so um, try to avoid round tripping. It, it's almost always creating some sort of problems, unless it's just a little bit. Now, do you see the challenge here in regards to get some predictable IPR in the front in this segment? It's impossible to achieve predictability unless we change some factors in the posterior part of the mouth first before we start drilling enamel away blindfolded. So I hope this illustrates the need for us to think really hard about what we do and in in what um, order we do it. So the timing is really, really important. Now oh, there are some other challenges. Um, so how can we treat a patient predict uh, predictably if we are too conservative or too aggressive? So both options are possible. I have seen dentists who have uh, taken away way too much enamel approximately, but usually, I'd say 98% of all cases, it's, it's the opposite. Usually we are so afraid of removing enamel in the approximal space that we remove too little. Now, to be on the safe side, I highly recommend uh, the IPR tips from Dentatus. And I hope I've illustrated why um, I think these tips are superior in comparison to all other systems on the market, actually. There's no other system that has calibrated tips. There's no other tips that are so easy to use as these. There is a system, a Swiss-based system that will have the same motion or movement of the tips, um, but their tips aren't calibrated and they are a little bit harder to use, in my opinion, than the Dentatus tips. So there are some challenges as well there, uh, just as well as they, it's, it's easier to um, provoke a bleeding from the soft tissue. Uh, at least that's my experience. So I really like the Dentatus tips in comparison to all the others. So at a line assist uh, service, we recommend the dentists to do the IPR. Now, we have several customers who let their dental assistants or hygienists do the IPR, just as it's done by the orthodontist sometimes. The treatment result will always be the responsibility of the doctor in the practice. So therefore, if you choose to delegate your IPR, please, please, please make sure to train your team members very, very thoroughly. Sit chair side with them the first 20 th times at least they're doing or going to perform the procedures themselves. Let them know they can always back out and let you take over should they feel uncomfortable with the procedure. Live up to your promises when they call upon your help. I mean, this is critical. Think about what system you will put in place to improve your workflow. I recommend you pick the one thing that requires the least effort to give the biggest impact. And I believe the IPR tips from Dentatus is such a thing. So feel free to send us an email, post a comment whether you like this webinar or not. Uh, you will find our contact information on our website, alignerservice.com. Should you have any questions, feel free to write or comment now, and I'll be here waiting to serve you and to ask or answer any questions you'd have. All right, so we have a couple of questions here. Um, there is a question about the whether the IPR tips are autoclavable or not. Um, they are autoclavable and I, I would say you can use them a lot of times. Uh, I don't have a, I don't actually have, I don't actually have a number of uh, times that I've used them, but I'd say at least 20 to 25 times. Um, how much they cost I, depends on the country. I really don't know. There's um, Dr. Fatemi uh, from the UK who's asking about the price. And I have to be honest that you will have to talk with your retailer about the price. But if you compare the price of the tips with uh, comparison um, uh, products on the market, um, 
as far as I remember, the price is actually a little bit lower uh, than the other systems. Um, and if you compare the price of these tips and the handpiece combined, and just think about what the amount of time that you will save, um, the amount of chair time saved will will I mean it will save you a lot more money than going with um, with the hand strip or uh, or some kind of polishing device. I mean uh, the price for a handpiece and these uh, it's it's really not what what makes or breaks the deal. The, the, it's actually the time that you spent with the patient in the chair, at least from from my side. Um, so there's another question. Could you use the dentatus tips in case you need to prepare a box for a restoration um, contact point uh, if it's very tight? As, as I understand the question, um, it's it's whether the the tip will go into the um, to the approximal space, I guess. Um, I mean, if you if you take a look at the uh, at the tip, it's 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 so big that if you just push it in between the teeth, it will not go there. Um, but if you have had a strip first, and you move up through the different uh, systems, so let's say you start with the point one, then point two, point three, point four, and point five, then you will be able to. Um, to shape uh, even bigger box-shaped uh, contact points. Um, it's not that tight. I mean, as I mentioned in the beginning, if you use a strip to just um, loosen up the contact point, it's rather easy to slip in these and use them. I know there are systems where it's, it's like, is if, if the, the system kind of gets stuck um, when, when you try to use it, uh, I haven't really, Experience that with with the dentata system. Um, in my hands, at least, it works really well. It is possible to to make a, a a tip get stuck, but I mean that's obvious if you if you try to take a too wide a tip to begin with instead of starting with a uh, a tip that is appropriate for for the amount of space you have, and then slowly work upwards. But I mean, it's like one, two, three go to the next one, one, two, three, go to the next one. It's really easy. And with the right assistant by your side, it takes no time. Um, then there's a question about how often we need to do the IPR. Well, it depends. Uh, if you ask about the sequence, it depends on the on the plan that we do, either in the clean check or in the setup, depending on the system that we use. Um, if you use uh, Invisalign, you know that uh, there there's sometimes uh, the system plans for 0.1 millimeter IPR, which we think is, well, it's a little bit difficult to plan in, in reality. Um, so you can you can go from 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, and, and so forth. If you use a system like ClickRec, they usually go with 0.3 or 0.6 millimeters. Um, so how often do we need to do the IPR? Again, it, it depends on your planning. Uh, in some systems, you will have to do IPR in eight, 10 different steps. If When we do our planning, we try to avoid it to a minimum, uh, usually to one or two appointments. But sometimes if we want to avoid the round tripping, sometimes you have to do it in a, in a couple of extra steps uh, just to ensure that you follow the biology of the patient. So, um, uh, John talks about great talk. Thanks. A great deal is said about general dentist orthodontic cases relapsing, but we all know that orthodontic cases also relapse. But few comment. Will this change? Um, well, uh, IPR as uh, as a tool for relapse or not doesn't really change anything. Uh, it's more question about how we um, secure the the final um, result that we achieve orthodontically with the, um, with either a bonded retainer or a removable retainer. And as we all know, the removable retainer uh, depends really a lot on the compliance of the patient. They have to to use the retainer, or else they they will get a relapse. 
Um, I can tell you that our sequence for, for retention is that after the final stage has been reached with the aligner system, we'll let the patient keep on uh, going with their aligners for three months, this 24, 24 hours a day, I mean, 22 hours, but 24 hours a day, they still wear this last aligner um, for at least three months. After three months, we can um, we can go down to 18 hours a day, and after an additional three months, they can start using their aligners only at nighttime. If you have teeth that have been rotated, uh, you definitely need to think about uh, a bonded retainer. If there's some issue with the tongues or the lips, I mean, the teeth are always placed in a balance between the lips and the tongue. The pressure from each side will decide where the, the teeth will stay. That will be a deciding factor in regards to retention as well. So, but if you have anything that is rotated quite a lot, uh, you really need to think about a bonded retainer. Uh, we like um, to bond the um, the eight anterior teeth on the lower. Uh, sometimes we bond the the four, the uh, six anteriors in the upper as well. But it depends. And if you have an, an widening of the arch and expansion, I mean, you can't just use a uh, a retainer for the lower anteriors, you need to 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 keep the width of the of the jaws as well. But this this is another discussion uh, taken us away from from the IPR tips. I mean, usually we, we spend an hour or two on our hands-on courses discussing retention. But great question anyway. Um, these IPR tips are they com uh, compatible with all hand pieces? No, they're not. As you can see, this hand piece. Uh, moves the oh sorry, uh, let's see if I can get you in here. This handpiece will move the um, the tips in and out. I'll try to illustrate it here. So when you have the tip in here, the tip will go in and out in an oscillating movement, um, and and it moves about um, two point two millimeters back and forth. So it it's. It's moving back and forth like this. Uh, so you need a handpiece that can facilitate that movement. Uh, as far as I remember, the handpiece in itself is not that expensive. And especially not if you compare it to the time you, you save from using this compared to any kind of hand-driven instrument or um, anything that is not, um, any kind of IPR that is not done with this. And again, I, I would, uh, highly recommend that you use something that is calibrated. Uh, to begin with, I was so frustrated about the time it took. I mean, we started using Inisalign back in 2008. And back then, we hadn't discovered the great things about these uh, these tips. And the, the IPR tips from Dentatus didn't come to the market before, I mean, five, five six years ago. Uh, ago. So to begin with, we, we started with rotating instruments, had all the issues with that, with bleeding and soft tissue issues with unpredictable uh, results. We had some issues with the shaping of the teeth. So we, we changed the, the, um, the discs to uh, mosquito burrs where we used the 0.2 millimeter mosquito burrs. That was really fast, but, um, but we're only reliable in the range of point. 2.3 millimeters of IPR. And we didn't know, do we take all of the enamel on one or the other tooth? So we wanted to, to get the, um, to increase the predictability of the IPR and we wanted to increase the safety of the patient as well. So we wanted to know that we moved, we removed uh, enamel on, on both teeth at the same time. And so if you look at the, uh, at the tip here, I think you'll be able to see there's a diamond coating on the one side as well as, as the other. So the tips have a diamond coating on both sides, which enabled us to remove exact, the exact amount of, of enamel on both teeth at the same time. If you want to reshape a tooth, it's of course you can just take a, a thinner tip and just push it towards the tooth you wanna reshape and do that. But I would, I would highly recommend you use a tip like this instead of a rotating burr. Um, so the most efficient way to protect tongue and cheek during the procedure? Uh, great question. I would say use a dentatus tip. Um, 
usually we would just retract uh, the uh, or keep the the lips away either with an what they called uh, I think it's uh, Ivoclar that makes these um, retraction devices of uh, of latex or something like that. Uh, right now I don't remember the name of them. Uh, we use them uh, whenever we we bond attachments in. Um, my dental assistants do that. Um, and sometimes when I had to do a lot of IVR, I would I'd put such a retraction device in the mouth of the patient as well. Um, but usually we'll just use a mirror, a hand mirror, and just hold the, um, the lip aside. Uh, when you use these, I mean, the tongue is really not a problem. Um, I mean, it as I mentioned, it moves back and forth about 2.2 millimeters, which is too little to actually uh, do any harm to the tongue. So even if the patient is, is curious with the tongue and puts the tongue up there, they won't uh, start to bleed. As well as if you touch the soft tissue, the gingival tissue with the with the tip, uh, the soft tissue will not start to bleed. Either the lip, nothing. I've, I've never had a patient start to bleed if I touch the soft tissue with these um, with these tips. I hope that answered that question. Um, do you treat the adjusted surfaces that have gone through IPR with anything to prevent possi possible sensitivity? Well, um, we do always, after we have done our IPR uh, and finished the IPR with the polishing the surface with the uh, point zero, uh, sorry, the point uh, one millimeter uh, um, IPR tip. Um, after we've done that, we usually um, coat the surfaces with a fluoride varnish. But to be honest, I don't think it's it's necessary. As long as you keep, as long as you only keep in the enamel, it shouldn't be uh, necessary. Uh, of course, the enamel has to be polished in order to prevent any kind of bacterial uh, adherence surface. But but just make sure that it's high gloss, uh, polished to high gloss. Um, and just put on a, a fluoride varnish, any kind of fluoride varnish. I don't use a Gluma desensitizer or something like that. I've never had the use for it. Um, uh, but especially because as long as you keep in the enamel and don't go through to the dentin, it's not a problem. But I do understand the question because if you use a rotating instrument uh, of any kind, a disc or a burr, you risk going through the enamel and into the dentin, and that will increase the risk of sensitivity and carious. And that risk is, again, is uh, prevented by using the IPR tips from Dentatus. Another reason that I really like these. Um, do Dentatus do a clinical demo film or using a kit on their website? Not yet, but I do believe they are planning to do it. Uh, so stay tuned. And I guess that within the next three or six months, they will have something coming up. It's a fast developing company. It's been uh, it's been a little um, it's been around for quite a while. I mean, back in in my days in dental school, twenty years ago. Well, that's a long time ago. Uh, we had all kind of dentatus instruments, and at that point, they had been on the market forever. Um, so I know that that the management is really doing a lot to um, to get stuff like this back to the market and, and show you how how well you can do with their products. And Dentatus is known for high quality with all the products that they, uh, they sent to the market. So yeah, I think within a reasonable time, there will probably be some kind of demo video, but they don't have it yet. Um, any study comparing efficiency of these tips versus hand-used strips for IPR? I know there have been done something. Um, if you use a diamond strip, approximately, studies show us that it will take at least 600 seconds um, to remove 0.3 millimeters. And I would say that's for someone using a blue strip and being very, very fast and very, very aggressive. Uh, we had a practice call us uh, a couple of weeks ago. They did their first IPR uh, case and we hadn't instruct them how to do it. And they were just frustrated because uh, they had spent two hours, two hours to do their IPR in, in their case and 
had they been using these tips, they could have been finished within, let's say, 10 minutes. So, and it, it correlates with my own experience in my practice. Um, but yeah, studies indicate that it takes about uh, 600 seconds to do a manual uh, 0.3 uh, removal of, um, uh, of enamel. And with the uh, IPR tips from Dentatus, it will take uh, at, ma at a maximum of uh, 100 seconds. So it, it will be at least six times faster, at least. Uh, and from my own experience, I would say it's a lot faster than using any kind of hand instrument. But that's my experience. Um, so I think those would be the questions so far. Do we have any others? So unless you have any other questions, please post them now, or we will be signing off in within the next five minutes. I hope this uh, webinar gave you some valuable insights to alternatives to um, manually stripping and shaping teeth, uh, getting away from the unpredictable rotating instruments like mosquito burrs or um, discs. Um, and then use something better like these calibrated tips from Dentatus. So I just think I'll wish you all a Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, um, and hope to see you here or hear from you on e by email or by phone. You're welcome to contact me at any time. Uh, please, for all the uh, Americans that might be looking <laughs> at me still, um, please take uh, into consideration that I live in Europe, so just so you don't wake me up in the middle of the night. With that said, I wish you a Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, and see you soon, at least.